Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Larry Laterman, and I am the chair of the Ambassador Speaker Series here at Carleton University. First, I would like to recognize some of our guests. The High Commissioner of Barbados, Her Excellency Yvonne Walks. The recently arrived High Commissioner of St. Kitts and Nevis, Her Excellency Sherry Tross. The High Commissioner of Cyprus, His Excellency Pavlos Anastasiades. And the Ambassador of Costa Rica, Roberto Dormond, who is just arriving. The High Commissioner of Guyana, Her Excellency Clarissa Riel. The Ambassador of Chile, His Excellency Alejandro Maricio. The uh, Ambassador of Ecuador, His Excellency Diego Stasi Moreno. And members of the embassies of Malaysia, the United States, Russia, and of course, Colombia. I would also like to welcome some former Canadian ambassadors. We have with us today the former Canadian ambassador to Colombia, Dean Brown, the former Canadian ambassador of Canada to Switzerland, Robert Collette, Robert Collette, the former Canadian ambassador to Kuwait, Rick Mann. And we also have members of the Canadian government, including global affairs, public safety, national defense, students, and faculty of Carleton University, of the University of Ottawa, Queen's University, and Algonquin College. It is now my pleasure to ask the Associate Director of the Norman Patterson School of International Affairs, Professor Jean Daudalin, to introduce our distinguished speaker. Jean. Uh, thank you, Larry. Sorry. Uh, uh, first of all, I'd like to say it's a particular pleasure for me to, uh, to be here tonight. Uh, I've studied Latin America for 30 years and I'm a longtime server of Colombia. Uh, Colombia is probably the most neglected country, uh, proportionately, I'd say, in the Americas. Uh, people forget that it's uh, very large. People forget that it has a very large population. Uh, people forget that uh, it's a country uh, that has not gone through the famous, uh, the famous um, period of extreme economic instability in the 1980s. And people just think about, uh, about drugs and just think about the war. But fortunately, um, the, the peace process uh, has been uh, taken to a successful conclusion. There are still a few things to be done. And that's what our guest will, will tell you about tonight. Because you will see, because I'll go through very briefly uh, his bio, uh, he's also extremely well qualified to speak about trade issues and integration issues in the Americas, something that is uh, very dear to the Canadian uh, hearts uh, these days. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, our distinguished speaker, uh, Ambassador Nicolas Lloreda Ricarte. He studied law at the University of Del Rosario in Bogota, in Colombia. In, in 1988, he graduated from New York University with a master's in law and stayed in New York for two until 1990 for two years. He then returned to Colombia, where he continued his career in law, joining a firm in Bogota. And uh, two years later, he left the law to work for the Colombian Ministry of Foreign Trade, where he remained until 1993. Then he was appointed director of the Colombian Government Trade Bureau in Washington, D.C., and minister counselor at the Colombian Embassy until 1997. Following his Washington assignment, he was appointed director general of the Andean Community, based in Lima, Peru, where he was involved in trade negotiations, including the FTA, the Free Trade Agreement of the Americas, that ended up not being signed in spite of, uh, of Canadian efforts, among others. At the end of the Lima assignment in 2001, Ambassador Lloreda returned to private practice in Washington, focusing on international arbitration and international business for the next nine years. In 2010, the ambassador was appointed by his government to be the arbitrator before the International Center for the Settlement of Investment Dispute then he was appointed deputy head of mission at the Colombian Embassy in Washington, D.C. And after three years in Washington, on February 14, 2013, he was named ambassador, he was named the Colombian ambassador to Canada. So please welcome Ambassador Nicolas Lloreda Ricaute. Thank you. 
Thank you very much for that long, generous, and kind introduction. And, and thank you, Larry. And um, thank you, really, for the Norman Patterson um, School of International Affairs and the uh, Ottawa Diplomatic Association for this invitation. Um, I really want to uh, mention my friend, Ambassador Larry, Larry Letterman, for providing me this opportunity. Uh, he is really a Colombianologist. He's been in my country many, many times and always sends me, in the midst of the winter, pictures from Cartagena. Uh, uh, <laughs> I also want to um, acknowledge uh, my fellow um, Ambassador High Commissioner Susan Lejeune uh, and her um, husband, uh, Stefan. Thank you for taking the time. They also spent some time in Colombia and uh, know well uh, the country, so I'm very happy to have you here. I, um, despite um, Larry's uh, uh, suggestion that I cannot say this, the same thing that I always say, as was the first thing he told me when he called me, um, I, I have a need to, to provide some context because I think, uh, uh, just by looking at the room, I think I, we, we have some people here that probably maybe know even more than me about my country, but perhaps there are others that don't. So I'm going to try to round it up in a way and then we can take it maybe in, in, in questions uh, from there. Um, I, I thought I would divide uh, the, the main presentation or the context of, of my words in, in four main uh, issues uh, and, then, um, and then take it to questions. So um, I think the first thing that, that I want to do, what I always do, it, it helps a lot with to understand uh, where we are right now is, is to think about where we were 50 years ago. I'm 55 years old, so I always try to think, okay, I have small children, and I always try to think, this is the world that they're living in, that we're leaving them, and how was the world uh, when I was their age? And uh, Colombia was a very different place than what it is today. Um, population was maybe a third of what it is. 62% of Colombians lived in rural areas, whereas that is now around 76% of the population. There have been uh, dramatic changes in the indicators of human development, such as a very uh, profound lowering of infant mortality, increase of life expectancy, the reduction of poverty, um, and uh, many other uh, numbers, as you can see. Um, how do we measure poverty? Since 2011, uh, the Colombian government has measuring poverty through the adaptation of the al Foster Method developed by the Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative that prioritizes the dimensions and indicators of the country's needs for public policy priorities. Multidimensional poverty assesses five dimensions, household education conditions, childhood and youth conditions, labor, health, and access to household utilities and living conditions. Extreme poverty, in Colombia, a person is considered in extreme poverty if the income is lower than the value of the basic food basket. In 2017, the value of the basic food basket was approximately $86 per month. For example, a family of four can be considered in extreme poverty if the total income is below $345 per month. This is because I always get the question, what about poverty? How do you measure poverty, etc.? So I thought I would get that out of the way. Another thing um, that I want to mention is that, um, as you saw before, 97% of the population has today access to health care, whereas that number uh, was less than 20% uh, even 30 years ago. Um, this, this impact has been uh, really uh, very important in the rural areas. Uh, another relevant indicator is education. We went from a literacy rate of 62% to 99%. and more importantly, or as importantly, the access to higher education has also improved. For example, in the last 15 years, the number of, gradu of people graduating from universities or colleges was 3 million, whereas in the last four decades before that, it, would, it had only been 1.5 million. Uh, the GDP growth of Colombia, as you were saying before, is, uh, has been very dynamic and very stable uh, since uh, 1985. Uh, it's the only country that uh, has only had, in the last 50 years, one year of negative growth uh, when the economy contracted in 1999. Uh, aside from that, every year has been a year of, of GDP growth, which is a little bit of, a, of an irony when you consider the, 
violence in the in the especially in the rural areas that was going on through all this time. B, we have been uh, a, a, an economy that is uh, very dependent on commodities for many many years. The main source uh, of government revenue was coffee, but for the last 35 or 40 years, it has been oil and coal and other uh, commodities. Uh, aside, of course, of an industrial base, but, but really in terms of, of royalties and revenue for the government that has been between 20, sometimes 25 or 30 percent of um, what the government receives. Now, um, one of the um, numbers that um, we like to mention a lot, and my president is very fond of himself being an economist uh, and having developed a lot of time to uh, uh, human development, is um, the fact that finally, you know, Colombia became a country in 1810, and it wasn't until 2014 uh, that for the first time in our history, the largest group of the population was middle class. So for an economist, that is a very big deal for thinking about the possibility of, the, of a country's development and, and its future uh, without the, the middle class brings a lot of opportunities and of course a strong middle class also brings challenges, brings uh, a, number, a group of people that have the capacity and the time to ask for more and to expect more uh, as we are seeing uh, throughout the world especially of the, after the last period of, uh, of economic development that we've had. It is, it is uh, I think, fairly known in Canada that uh, after having a very high rate of homicides for many years, uh, Colombia has been reducing the homicide rate at a very important level. Um, and uh, even in the last six years, the, there has been a reduction of 32%. And uh, in last year, it was the lowest in 42 years. So even though at 24.7% per 100,000, uh, uh, inhabitants, it's still high compared to other cities or countries. Uh, the reduction has been very significant and of course this has a lot to do with the geography where we are. In the large cities uh, this number is much lower. The last few years we've seen a lot of um, uh, turmoil, of uncertainty, uh, especially for economies including to a certain extent Canada that are reliable on, on uh, uh, certain uh, commodities like for example oil in the last few years after having a very large increase of oil which of course uh, provides uh, needed revenue for governments but also uh, makes governments more prone to spending um, has had a, a very let's say uh, let's say it's, a, it's like a, a, a bless in, 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 in so, and, and it's also a curse in, in other aspects because you uh, a country like Colombia 48 million people only two million people pay income tax. Uh, so you have uh, a number and you have an, uh, an expected amount of people, around nine, nine million that should be paying income tax. There was more formalization and it was a uh, cashless or, or, or there was more, uh, less cash in the society. Uh, we find that the government is still needs to invest uh, in social spending uh, significantly. And uh, um, this, uh, for uh, an economy that is uh, large, uh, the third largest in, in, in South America, um, the only country that has never defaulted in its debt. Um, this uh, fact that we've been able to, for the last 20 years, to control inflation and, and uh, create investment uh, opportunities, now with a reduction of violence, allows us to at least expect more strong growth. However, uh, with the reduction of the prices of oil and the fact that the government had embarked in a much more large social spending, uh, there, there has the last uh, year, 2017, uh, the economy had the lowest rate of growth in many years at 1.8%. So 1.8% for other countries could be a good number, but for, for a developing country like Colombia clearly is not enough and actually puts in risk uh, some of the social indicators that, that the government uh, has been able to achieve in the last 10 years. We've um, benefited also by a policy that began roughly uh, 20 years ago of opening the economy to, by uh, really allowing more foreign investment and entering into a number of free trade agreements that uh, uh, allow our industries to import inputs for many other countries and also all our exporting 
uh, industries to reach many other markets. Uh, after a long, um, long debate, the government finally uh, and, the, and the country finally agreed to open its economy in, in many areas that had been protected for years. Uh, and even though this protection had allowed for the development of our, of our own industrial base, the reality was that uh, after a while, without the competition of other markets, uh, many of the industries were not being efficient. Um, and the result is that we have a more dynamic competition, a lot more, especially a very significant increase in foreign investment. We have now uh, 15 free trade agreements in force. We are pending the approval of Congress for the 16th free trade agreement with Israel. And as you know, the Pacific Alliance is negotiating as we speak with uh, Canada, with whom all the Pacific Alliance countries have a trade agreement, but also with Singapore, Australia, and New Zealand to expand uh, the trade. And in the case of Colombia, very important to reach uh, more into uh, the Pacific. On this, on this same topic um, of uh, opening our economy and trying to improve the transparency of our process. Uh, the current government has been very bullish in uh, trying to manage to get Colombia inside the OECD. Uh, many of you know very well what the OECD does and, 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 and is, but maybe for those of you that, that are in, in other uh, disciplines, uh, for us, the way Colombia sees the OECD is really going to a club of developed economies that are trying to provide for a lot more transparency, a lot more uh, evidence-based process throughout the whole uh, system of government. And this is, this is extremely important, it's costly. Uh, it has meant uh, five years of work changing laws and decrees uh, in order to comply with the committees of the OECD in order what, what, what what a regulatory framework of a country should look like if you're trying to make it more uh, interesting for investors, more transparent for rating agency, banks, uh, and anybody that is looking into the way the finances of the government, the process of, of uh, contracts are, are being done in the country. Um, quickly, um, on the uh, bilateral relationship, the relationship between uh, between uh, our two countries has been a solid one for many, many years. Uh, just last year, uh, President Santos had his state visit, the first state visit by a uh, by, uh, president of Colombia in 19 years. Um, it was, uh, I think, a successful visit uh, with uh, a lot of issues that were discussed uh, with the Canadian cabinet. Uh, and it was also, I think, the recognition by the Canadian government of uh, what the government of Colombia has been doing in the last seven years uh, towards the improvement of the living conditions and uh, on the peace process uh, in Colombia. The, um, for us, more than trade, and I'll go into trade a little bit, but I think perhaps uh, even though trade is important and, 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 and is uh, quite varied, it is not, uh, uh, our, our largest trading partner continues to be the United States and then China. Um, for many, many years, our second largest partner was Venezuela, but that's another story. Um, but in the case of, Colo uh, of Canada and Colombia, what we've experienced, especially in the last 15 years, has been a significant increase of Canadian investment that began in mining, oil and gas, banking, uh, services, um, infrastructure, consulting, and this is uh, uh, an investment that we welcome that has benefited significantly and that um, continues to, to uh, increase every year. Even uh, in 2016, Canada was the largest uh, foreign investor in Colombia, and uh, again, it continues to expand the breadth of the areas in which uh, different Canadian companies from all the provinces are looking into Colombia and entering to very important partnerships. We have approximately um, roughly 450 million uh, US dollars that were exported uh, last year, whereas uh, we imported approximately 700 million. We've had uh, uh, trade balance, uh, a trade uh, Im imbalance, now that that term is so much in, in fashion, uh, with Canada, 
but this is really uh, the result uh, mostly of uh, probably, I mean, the, the, the way our manufacturers look at it has been for years is that it is possibly uh, more efficient for them to set some of their products in the U.S. market. Uh, slowly but surely, more and more Colombian exporters are approaching the Canadian market, entering into agreements, and the good thing is that both our exports and our imports continue to grow. Uh, another uh, sector that is important for us is tourism. In general, uh, Colombia had last year the largest increase of tourism since we measure. We had more than six million visit foreign visitors, which is a very large number for us. Um, and uh, those, those numbers are really bringing into question, the, the uh, actually raising a lot of questions for Colombia in terms of really um, modifying uh, our, our tourism infrastructure and uh, also uh, creating opportunities for different regions to enter into agreements in order to foster and take advantage of, of this uh, increase uh, of tourism that again continues to be uh, based on our expectation and our estimates, very small, and that the, the expectation is that the potential is, is much larger. Um, another um, point that is very important to mention is that uh, the previous Canadian government and the current Canadian government have both been staunch, strong supporters of the Colombian peace process. Uh, Canada has been present in Colombia in uh, cooperation and in uh, assistance, uh, much of it for many years, uh, very independently taken from, from the government, uh, which is perfectly uh, uh, acceptable in terms of, of Canada's decision for many years to go on their own on the way they provided cooperation and, and engage with what they thought or what they think are Colombia's needs and the places where Canada could, could you know, contribute. That, uh, in my own personal view, I think uh, the, the fact that that cooperation, which really goes across uh, many lines, uh, is, um, is uh, now uh, in more than 50% uh, closely coordinated with the Colombian government. That is, for the first time in our bilateral relationship since we've been receiving different kind of cooperation from Canada, we find that Canada is jointly designing and working with the Colombian government to what the Colombian government has identified are our priorities in terms of development and in where we require technical assistance. And that, uh, it, the way I see it is, is uh, is a way of Canada saying, you know, we, we, we understand, we validate what your government policy-wise is aiming at, and this is what we're working together. Now, the other part of this, of course, is as Canada is starting to see Colombia as a bigger economy, a stronger economy, that if cooperation is to continue, it will not be a one-way cooperation, but it must be bilateral cooperation, as it is becoming, in which Colombia is assuming between 30 and 50 percent of uh, support in, in, in the new projects. But the fact remains uh, that Canada has been a very generous and very important contributor throughout, even before the peace process began, in some of the most sensitive areas. As you, as you, many of you know, there is a very stark difference between the conditions of the uh, big cities and of the rural areas in Colombia, and uh, the conflict in Colombia has been really a conflict in the rural areas, um, and, and it is there in, in, in areas where have uh, very uh, difficult and, and low indicators that Canada, along with other countries, has been uh, present. Let me talk a little bit about uh, challenges and opportunities, and I think the first thing that the before, and I, I'm, I'm just pretty much predicting what, what some of the questions that I generally get uh, could be, are uh, how is the implementation of the peace agreement going? We all know that uh, in Colombia we uh, already had parliamentary elections uh, last week and uh, we will be having presidential elections in six weeks or five weeks. Uh, maybe a first round if, if there is no candidate that gets more than 50 plus one of the votes, 50 percent of one of the votes, they, we will go to a runoff. Uh, and uh, the truth is that uh, there's a lot of uh, questions about how the peace agreement is going. So there's several ways of looking at it and I think uh, 
the first one, the first thing I would say is that if we if we look at at what what generally for for the um, the outsider would be the m the biggest elements of a peace agreement are you know the disarmament of combatants that is completely done. FARC has given up all their weapons, have, has provided the information as to where all the other weapons are. Uh, they uh, have signed a peace agreement that is being implemented and uh, they have been recognized as a political party and they, the laws that provide for their participation politically have been uh, enacted and are in, our, in our force. So uh, that part of the agreement is done and uh, personally I think it would be very difficult to backtrack on, on any of those aspects. Now, the, the truth is that the peace agreement is a commitment uh, of the government in many, many areas for over 15 years because one of, the, there's one of the most important aspects of the peace agreement was the treatment of land concentration in Colombia because that is widely seen as the origin uh, not the only cause, but the origin of the, of the conflict. And it is because of this that this is a very lengthy process that has a lot of opposition. And, and I would say, again personally, that I think a, a big part of the opposition that we see to the peace agreement comes really from the promises of the government to change uh, land concentration in Colombia by establishing a national updated land registry uh, that taxes uh, unproductive land uh, uh, accordingly. Uh, this is something that really has divided the traditional elites in Colombia and um, it is something that will take quite some time. So uh, there's different ways of measuring the implementation of the peace agreement. This is a commitment that will take a very long time and of course a uh, big part of the question as to how it will go in those aspects will depend on who the next government is and what the next government decides to do. Um, the, it's interesting uh, on that point just to think about what the current, so there we had elections last week and um, starting on August 7th when the new uh, government comes into office we will have a new Congress and this new Congress will have a very interesting composition because there is no majority as you can see um, and uh, Whoever wins will have to build on coalitions, uh, and uh, that is, uh, you know, is always an opportunity. Uh, it, it hopefully, if we want to look at the glass half full, will mean that whoever becomes president will will work at at the the definition of, of politics, no, the art of the possible, and try to reach uh, a way forward. But it will be uh, tough. It will be tough because. Um, um, whoever wins will find out, as we are watching in many countries where we have a, a runoff, that your, your full support uh, sometimes is not really 51%, is not 60%, it's 20%. You went to a runoff and you had to get the support of others to win. So the way that that, uh, that uh, victory for whomever the victory comes uh, is implemented will determine um, not only the, the future of the implementation of other aspects of the peace process, but in general, the next um, uh, way that Colombia will be moving. This is also another explanation. I think the previous one was, oh, this is the Senate, and this is the House of Representatives. Um, so um, it'll be interesting to see um, how, how all this uh, comes into place. So on, on just to finish on quickly on on the, uh, uh, the, the commitment of the, of the government to implement the peace process. Another aspect that we, we see a lot in the, in the press, and especially uh, you, you read a lot about it in, in, in the U.S. press, is uh, what has to do with illegal crops. Colombia is uh, sadly worldwide known as a large exporter of cocaine. We all remember that you know, 50 years ago there was hardly any coca in, uh, planted in the whole country of Colombia, just a little bit in the south of our country. Uh, and you know, we became in, in 20 years uh, the largest producer several years of coca in the world. Um, just uh, in the jungles with a terrible environmental uh, uh, cost 
uh, and only mainly to to uh, export as cocaine to to the developing uh, to the developed markets. Um, but uh, in the in the peace process, and this is something that many uh, critics of the opposition and many people mention, is that one of the arguments of FARC during the peace process was, well, what are we going to do with with this? Uh, informal economy that we have. We, we know that there's many, many people in the rural areas, in the remote areas of Colombia, that have their, received their, their only income from growing uh, illegal crops. And the promises of the government to address this situation, to subsidize, to help formalize uh, the population, meant that there was a very big, during the negotiation, increase in the uh, uh, planting of crops with the expectation, you know, if we plant all this, we will re we'll receive more money. There was another element that had a lot to do when the prices of oil fell, as, as many of you know, many of the currencies devaluated versus the US dollar. That made the production of a crop that is going to be sold outside in US dollars much more profitable in Colombia. And so those two elements contributed to an increase after several years of decline of the production of, of coca crops in Colombia to an increase. Now, the last year, uh, 2017, the government eradicated a, a record uh, 50,000 hectares. And the commitment for next year is to eradicate, for this year, to eradicate 65,000 hectares. Uh, but it will it continue to remain a very difficult issue within the whole of Colombia is how to deal with this, with this um, uh, mechanism of, of growing coca and producing cocaine in very remote areas and, and shipping it overseas. The other aspects uh, I think I've already mentioned of what the post-conflict post scenario is. I think the only one I, I can uh, perhaps talk a little bit about uh, is um, the ELN. The ELN is the uh, smaller, depending on who you ask, between 1,000 and 1,600 combatants. Um, it's a group that is uh, much less hierarchical than FARC. And this makes uh, negotiations much more difficult because it is very, it, is, uh, it has proven impossible for the government to really evidence that the negotiators sitting at the table speak on behalf of the whole organization and the fact that it has been impossible to maintain a ceasefire for a significant amount of time speaks to this. Um, President Santos, uh, Nobel Prize winner continues to insist that there has to be a way on this and uh, despite the fact that ELN continues or groups of ELN continue to wreak havoc in areas and, and uh, attack soldiers and commit uh, crimes, uh, the government so far is following the same policy with FARC that is to speak to the illegal group outside of the country and in, inside of the country to continue to combat any uh, criminal activity. Another question that I get, and I'm, I, I'm going to try to, to stick to what my president has said publicly uh, so I don't get into trouble or more trouble. Um, but uh, we have a neighbor, uh, a brother, neighbor, um, that has been our wealthy neighbor for many, many years and that is going through a very difficult crisis, a uh, crisis that uh, uh, affects Colombia significantly. Uh, Venezuela has no larger border with any country than with Colombia, more than 2,200 kilometers of a very porous border, you know, with more than uh, 25 or 30 small cities or towns uh, bordering in each side of the border, more than 22 rivers, uh, an extremely complicated and absolutely on, uh, on uh, very difficult to police because much more than two-thirds of that border goes through, through jungle. Uh, and and uh, the fact that there is instability and that we have received uh, a number, I mean, right now what is happening in Venezuela is the, the biggest refugee crisis, I think, that has ever happened in, in South America. I don't think ever in South American history we can remember a crisis like, like the one we're, we're, we're experiencing. And in our case, it means that according to our uh, uh, migration authorities, um, just in last year there were more than 800,000 
uh, Venezuelans, they came in and only 30% of that number returned. Um, we have over 1.5 million Venezuelans that have come into Colombia and registered in the Colombian special migration card uh, that allows them to cross the border, buy foods and products, uh, considering that uh, the bilateral relationship right now is, is uh, at a point in which there is no open border. Uh, we just open the border from time to time to let uh, our fellow brothers into the country to buy what they claim they cannot get in their country. Um, we are starting to receive actually international cooperation by several countries as to how to handle this ref refugee crisis. We've uh, created a special permanent unit, permanent uh, permit uh, that allows for, for Colombians to work, study, and do certain things. Um, and this is a way we see of trying to avoid uh, the establishment of refugee camps that are something that, as you all know, can, can uh, last for many years. We uh, see with great concern the deterioration of the situation in Venezuela. We have called for a dialogue in the, uh, with the opposition and through multilateral scenarios such as the Lima Group, the OAS, the United Nations, Colombia is actively seeking more cooperation and calling for uh, democracy in our neighbor. You've heard, we've all heard many times that there's two kinds of predictions, lucky and wrong. But uh, we still have to uh, do, and, and we try to gather data to try to estimate where are we going. And uh, you know, there are different people that say, well, what do you really bring of the peace process to Colombia? A big, a big um, uh, number that came out a lot after the parliamentary elections in Colombia was, hey, what, what happened with FARC? Only 50,000 people out of 34 million people that can vote in Colombia and 17 million people that voted for parliamentary elections, only 50,000 people voted for FARC. Uh, does that mean that the government gave too much and that FARC really only had this? Or does that mean that FARC and, and this, this uh, myth that we keep hearing that of Castro Chavismo uh, is coming to Colombia is something that Colombians really don't want. I think that there's a little bit of both in the, uh, in the fact that, that perhaps FARC and many pollsters uh, did not estimate correctly the, the, the level of, of hate and resentment there is throughout the country towards FARC. Uh, and this was very clear in the polls. There were a lot of polls that were expecting much li larger numbers and, and clearly it was, it was the far right and the, and the center right that got more votes, and I think as a as a as a way of showing that the country doesn't go in, that doesn't want to go in that direction, or at least from the 50 percent of the population that actually voted. Um, the 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 now getting into the estimates, the the expectation of many economists is that this the peace process should bring an additional one to two percent of growth in GDP. Uh, thanks to the increase of, of investment, household uh, consumption, and the improvement of trade. Um, again, the, also the fact that the, the improvement in national security and the fact that business of all types can access many areas uh, will also um, allow us to estimate uh, a very significant increase in foreign investment. So if we are receiving now the largest foreign investment that we've received in, in 30 or 40 years, uh, if we can expect that, that again uh, gives us uh, optimism to think that we could increase our GDP and perhaps double it in less than 10 years, which is something that would be very useful and important. One of the biggest um, examples is, um, or, or, or one of the, the, the biggest bets is in, in agro-industry. Uh, Colombia is a, it's a large country, obviously, when, you, when, when you're from Canada, well... <laughs> Uh, all countries are small, but uh, but let's say but let's say there uh, there's a lot of of uh, cultivatable land with wonderful weather conditions, plenty of water, and very apt for uh, for uh, agro industry uh, that could be uh, is currently being formalized, and that's a big part of it. And there, Canada has been very active and helpful, and could be a very significant source of. Uh, income and benefit for, for large groups. And, and again, some people expect that this, this could add significantly to GDP. Um, uh, among the, the main projects that are being uh, evaluated right now, 
are on um, a development of a large belt of cocoa crops, constructions of biorefineries and biomass plants to transport sugar cane and, and palm oil, and uh, you know the large production of pulps, jams, uh, sauces, and other products uh, from tropical fruits. Um, there are a number of uh, uh, of uh, uh, incentives that the government has uh, uh, pulled out. Uh, one is called the ZOMAX, which are special fiscal areas, uh, areas uh, uh, where uh, before there was no state presence and where the government is offering a very uh, generous tax uh, 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 regime for uh, investors. And this goes along with a, a new law called ZIDRE that was uh, uh, approved by our Congress and ratified by our Constitutional Court that allows for large agricultural development very closely joined with the community uh, and with the local communities in a win-win um, um, uh, format. These are some of the areas um, where we see uh, the new areas are the where we see a lot of uh, potential in the orange lower belt in, in agro-industry. Um, and um, there are a number of, um, as I mentioned, uh, whoever is interested, we at the embassy can provide a lot of information as to the new tax incentives and, and industry incentives uh, for this new process. Now, aside from cooperating, aside from investment, what does Canada do? Canada does a lot of things with Colombia. We have a really strong and varied agenda. Um, we work very closely, and, and, and Canada has been a strong supporter of uh, something called MAP through OAS, which is a peace process mission that began with the um, previous government entering into an agreement with the paramilitaries, by which 30,000 paramilitaries gave up the, with their weapons and uh, came back into society. And um, uh, Canada has been supporting and, and this, this program. And, but Canada is also working on many multilateral aspects, including environmental aspects, um, trade aspects. And right now that, that we see so much uncertainty in so many countries, the fact that we are working in so many multilateral aspects with Canada is really welcome. We, we think and we expect that this is something that should continue um, after the, the Colombian elections. We are also expecting us to see um, the, all the different bilateral and multilateral um, meetings that will take place during the next uh, month in the Summit of the Americas and in Peru, uh, and where we expect that, that um, Canada and, and, and Colombia will, will play an, an important role. Um, I think I'm going to leave it as, at that and uh, maybe take some questions if there's questions. Thank you very much for your time. I, I thank you for this question. I think it's a, there's, uh, in order to answer properly, there's, I think there's a number of things, but, but uh, timing had a lot to do with it. I think uh, you're right that for many, many years, there's books actually written in Colombia about all the failed peace process, all the times throughout the decades that different governments, right-wing governments, left-wing governments, embarked on negotiations with FARC and there was no result. I think, um, uh, the, 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 the theory that I uh, 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 agree with the most is that first we had a very uh, uncommon situation because Colombia is the second oldest democracy in the hemisphere and for 150 years we've had four-year governments um, with one exception of one military dictatorship in the 50s that lasted four years uh, and uh, that means that uh, Whenever a government began uh, a negotiation, uh, the, the guerrillas would wait and see how, if the next government has something better. Uh, and when finally uh, we get a 
you know, we, we get a president that is elected and that decides that he's not going, a, a president that inherits a situation in which a gov the previous government, 1998 to 2002, a candidate, former President Pastrana, uh, began and won a close election because he said he was going to make peace with FARC. And because of that promise, he won. And when once he won, he granted FARC a piece of land the size of Switzerland uh, where the uh, Colombian government authorities would not go in uh, for the negotiation to begin. And he spent the next three years trying to agree on an agenda uh, with FARC, while FARC used that area to export all that cocaine and bring in all the weapons that they could and really strengthen themselves. Now, uh, to its merit, this government that did this failed peace process was also responsible for what is known as Plan Colombia, which was going to the United States and going to the Colombian elite and asking them to really multiply the, num the taxes that they would pay to arm and prepare the armed forces and uh, getting a commitment, a very uh, uh, strong commitment by the United States to support militarily and uh, in uh, intelligence uh, for many years, FARC. So, uh, so this president was not successful. People were very, very discontent. And the next president wins exactly on the opposite, wins on the promise that he will do war to FARC. And when he wins exactly on the opposite that his predecessor had won, he embarks, he, he benefits from Plan Colombia that is beginning to be operational. And Colombia in the past, in the, you know, in five years passes to be a country that has maybe 10 uh, armed helicopters to have 150 Black Hawks. And really uh, develops the second largest army uh, in, in the hemisphere uh, after Brazil and the southern hemisphere and 500,000 between if you, if you add Army, Navy, Air Force, and police. And uh, he then, this president, changes the Constitution and is able to run once more. So FARC sees and realizes that this war is going to continue. And the war continues, and FARC gets debilitated, and the government starts taking back the territory. And then the other element of violence uh, that was the narco-traffickers and the paramilitary decide to go into, lay down their weapons and go into, into uh, legality through this government. So all these leaves FARC in a difficult situation. So when, when a new president comes that is also elected on continuing uh, the security agenda, FARC decides to go to the table, sit on the table, and the, a process begins in which uh, the, the team really that has to be recognized because this uh, our president who, who uh, received the Nobel Prize really benefited from a very professional team of negotiators that um, really studied history and really went back not only to all the failed attempts that for years had uh, burdened us, but also studied the and, 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 and went and visited and brought people and looked at the Northern Ireland, looked at uh, many of the conflicts throughout the world and trying to understand that every conflict is different but there are similarities. And I think this strong team uh, that wouldn't give up and the fact that because of the previous president having changed the constitution, President Santos also had the chance of a second term, allowed negotiations that were supposed to last one year and lasted five years to finally terminate. So I think that was one strong element uh, um, trying to answer your question. Um, Mr. Ambassador, Jean Boudin, I pretty much been introduced before. Um, uh, you, met, you just mentioned Brazil for the first time uh, by saying that they had a larger army than, than, than Colombia, but with 200 million people, you would expect that. Uh, could you give us, could you tell us a bit uh, something about the state of the relationship with Brazil, but also with um, what Colombia is doing in South America now that its domestic situation is less uh, all-encompassing, I mean, in terms of the preoccupations of the government, especially regarding Venezuela, for instance. Because if you put the borders of Venezuela 
Well, it's basically Brazil and Colombia. That's, so, so what exactly, how is Colombia engaging? How well is it working? And uh, who, are, who are Colombia's friends and partners in the region? Thank you. Um, no, Brazil, Brazil has, has been a strong partner of Colombia, has been a very strong supporter of the peace process. Uh, and uh, even though we border Brazil, uh, you know, the border that Colombia has with Brazil, like with Peru, is mostly jungle. But we have a very healthy exchange uh, of trade. We have a, a trade agreement. We have a lot of Brazilian investment. Um, and, and we've worked very closely uh, with the previous Brazilian government and with this one on the peace process and also on, on trying to to work for a multilateral solution uh, with our uh, fellow neighbor, trying to find a diplomatic solution and, and trying to to convince our fellow neighbor to, to uh, have uh, fair elections. So with Brazil, we, we, we work very closely. Um, we we uh, we we see a lot of investment. There's a lot of Colombian companies in Brazil investing in Brazil. We have a really strong bilateral uh, trade and investment relationship. And right now, we also both countries are parts of the Grupo de Lima. And with Brazil, we we share many experiences, um, some of which we also share with Canada about dealing with with uh, natural development resources, uh, communities, indigenous. Groups and there's a lot of uh, exchanges and and trying to to replicate what works and 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 how what uh, you know we also share many things with Brazil uh, informality um, uh, local gangs and uh, uh, and the, the the scourge of the of the drug trafficking drug trafficking so so we I'm sure we can do a lot more uh, but we have a a strong relationship. Uh, thank you, Ambassador. Thanks very much for your presentation. Very interesting. Uh, my question is more of a bilateral nature. Uh, now that the civil war is basically over and that you, you're dealing uh, very admirably with the drug situation, um, I want to come down to between Canada and Colombia. Colombia seems to me to be a country that's going to be a, a really strong growing interest for tourism. And uh, so I'd like to know what percentage of your GNP and GDP and, and what efforts you're putting into that. And secondly, from a Canadian standpoint, uh, I've been there twice in the last couple of years and Last year, for the first time when I went, I was sort of sh shocked by uh, being slapped with an $80 fee to get into the country as a tourist. And um, I'm wondering, first, if you know about this. I hope you do. And, and secondly, uh, what? Why is it continuing? My understanding was that this occurred. This was this was charged or put into practice uh, under the previous government, Canadian government, and that I thought with uh, with the Liberal government it would be uh, rescinded. Uh, I was told by a border official in your country that. Only Canada and Nicaragua have to pay this fee. Uh, it's sort of dubious company, maybe. But I'm wondering if there's um, if there's progress being made to to, to eliminate that fee, and then you get more Canadians. I think. Absolutely. Um, well, thank you for your question. Um, <laughs> uh, but it's a it's a valid point. I think I think that in you know um, in every strong close relationship you have sometimes irritants and, and, and if, if we have one irritant uh, with with our uh, uh, with the government of Canada is the um, the immigration issue and this this has uh, like like most irritants uh, that don't get resolved quickly uh, it has a, a long history and, and I, I let me let me give you a, a, a an incomplete personal view uh, and and really uh, I think what happened on that front that uh, that we are working on uh, and we continue to work on was a combination of factors. Um, the previous government of Canada uh, was a government that, uh, you know, for their own reasons, uh, concluded that it was important to tighten up the immigration process. Uh, and I think that coincided with the fact that, as you know, um, in Colombia, especially between 1997 and the year 2004, uh, the situation was very dire. Uh, we had a very big um, um, uh, flow of, of professionals that left the country uh, because it was unsafe. Uh, and uh, Canada has a very aggressive immigration policy. Canada goes all over the world uh, and tells young professionals, uh, if you are young and you have an education, you should come to Canada because we need to 
bring more people to this. And that makes it very interesting when you think, wow, Canada, 10th economy, 10th largest economy in the world, healthcare is included in your taxes, um, education is included in your taxes, uh, and uh, you know, you can always buy a coat. Um, and <laughs> so, so there was a number of, uh, a, a very large number of, of uh, Colombian, professional Colombians that moved there, but I think it also meant that you know, once you had a family of 10 Colombians living here, well, you know, you know, you always have the brother that didn't make it to university. Well, he wanted to come too, uh, and there was all but all, eventually somebody telling him, well, you know, you just come in as a business tourist, and then you uh, apply for for refuge or, or other things. And and I think um, uh, the the numbers starting to uh, uh, of people claiming. Um, uh, refuge, especially when things started to improve in Colombia, uh, became a, a concern for the Canadian authorities that decided to basically make it much more difficult to come. And it came to a point that, and I, I was, I, you know, I experienced this firsthand, uh, there were dozens and dozens of businessmen uh, that couldn't come, couldn't come to do business because it was very difficult to get a visa. It was the most difficult visa. It was much easier to get a visa to the United States or to any country than to Canada. So the reaction of so many people that felt that they just needed to do business or tourism, had no intention of staying in Canada and were rejected, meant that the government had to respond. And so the government responded to this uh, lack of flexibility of, of getting access to with this uh, fee that is, is in reciprocity to the fact that Canada also uh, included an extra charge in, in the process to get a visa uh, for Canada, for Colombians. So, so this extra charge and the difficulty created this and, and for the last few years we've been debating and discussing how to improve that flexibility. I think we're advancing, uh, not as fast as we would all like. I agree with you that that uh, we receive a lot of complaints from uh, Canadian tourists about having to pay this fee. Uh, a lot of people do not understand what a reciprocity fee is. Um, we wish more of them would. Um, but uh, I, I think we're, 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 this is one issue that was discussed uh, with our presidents in the state visit. Um, I am, I am um, hopeful and, and somewhat optimistic that, that we, will, we will solve that. Thing. It sounds a bit self-defeating on both sides, if I could just add a comment. I'm sorry? It sounds a bit self-defeating on both yeah, sides. Yeah, no, I think, I think we'll make progress eventually, and, and I, I agree with you that, that uh, there, are, there is enough um, data uh, intelligence exchange that would allow us to have a more flexible system, and I'm, 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 I'm hopeful that we'll get there. Um, hi, my name is Juan Ocampo, and I'm studying at Carleton in the Public Administration Program. I also work at Global Affairs Canada. Um, I have a question regarding the upcoming presidential elections. Um, more specifically, how do you see the role of Canada uh, changing in the post-conflict phase following the presidential election? Uh, especially when you have uh, one of the leading candidates is Iwan Duque and his Centro Democratico, whose platform is based partly on renegotiating the peace agreement. So how would you see Canada's role um, changing if this was to happen, if he was to? Well, you know, I mean, I, 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 my first thought is to, you know, ask, why don't you look at what Canada did when the uh, election happened in the U.S.? They adapt, uh, um, and they are adapting. But, I, you know, I, I, again, I, it's, it's very difficult to predict what's going to happen and who's going to win. But I, I wanted to include in my presentation the composition of the new Congress, because I think that whoever wins uh, ha will have to realize that, that the things that have already been implemented of the peace agreement cannot be ripped up. Uh, I personally think that this, uh, you know, outrage over impunity and the fact that uh, war criminals like the uh, head of FARC uh, can, while their while their investigation and their special justice system is is developed, can actually go to Congress, is a red herring. I think the the real issue behind the opposition of of the rural elite is, is land reform, uh, and I think that's going to take some time. But I, I think that whoever wins will have to 
uh, live. And, and, you know, something that is already implemented and working, I don't think that they're going to rip that off. But I, I think that depending on who wins, the, that there could be a, 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 a longer delay in implementing some of the commitments. Thank you very much, Larry. Uh, I'm going to start by probably getting myself into a little bit of trouble. Uh, so it's always fun to do that. And, and I, I would like to thank you, uh, Your Excellency, for, for not listening to Larry and starting the way you did. And in part because uh, my colleague uh, Jean Daudelin had forecasted accurately, so I guess in your classification that makes him lucky, that we would, didn't know very much about Colombia. So I learned an awful lot this evening uh, about your country, and I thank you for bringing that to us uh, here. Uh, by the way, we also make really good coats. So it's okay. <laughs> uh, the, the other thing that I, part, what was interesting at the beginning for me was to look at your, the progression, the 50 year snapshots that you gave. And it was almost a lesson in the social determinants of health. If you looked at where the improvements were, where you highlighted improvements in certain economic slash social dimensions, mm -hmm. you could actually see benefits coming out in more standard measures of health outcomes. So that struck me quite interesting, interestingly. The other, another thing that was interesting was the growth in tourism that you highlighted. And I w couldn't help but notice that you had roughly over a similar period a lot of activity on the trade negotiation and agreement front. And what I didn't know and still don't know, and that's okay, is whether the trade agreements actually brought the, the, the travel or whether it was a continued growth of travel in the proximity. Because then, as it, it would imply a completely different notion of the benefits of trade because all of a sudden there's a cultural dimension to all of this that would be about bringing people from quite a distance to experience your culture as opposed to locally that was interesting the last bit i must say re really struck me was your discussion about your relationship situation with venezuela and uh, i had not thought of this as a refugee problem at all and so that was really enlightening to think of this and really interesting to see how it manifests itself in part as a result of a policy decision uh, in a completely different way than in other, in other places. And so as we kind of go through this process, I do hope that Canada and Colombia can work together to make that part of uh, South America a safer, more democratic area uh, and that I must say uh, is is a hope that I carry very fervently and thank you very much for your presentation it was a pleasure to have you thank you very much